Hi, good afternoon, and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. So if the other presenters just give me a quick thumbs up so they can hear me, which I'm sure they will. Um, I just want to say thank you for um, attending the um, webinar this afternoon. So um, Zimmer, Peacock and PalmSense, we've decided to sort of team up again and do a webinar around um, electrochemistry. Uh, so what's going to happen this afternoon is I will um, I'll do a little introduction in a minute, but I think whilst we're waiting for people to join, I just want to say that we there's a little poll um, that you can fill, a little questionnaire, and all it's going to ask you is, um, what's the motivation for attending this afternoon? So maybe you're just bored and you want to you know, have something entertaining to watch. That's, that's a great motivation. Um, maybe you're particularly interested in, caf in coffee. I know it's a favorite with me and you really genuinely want to know about the caffeine in coffee. So, you know, we would like to hear that motivation. If your motivation is kind of more about electrochemistry and you want to know about cyclovoltammetry, um, you know, then certainly, you know, put that down as your motivation. But um, as, I, as I say, then there is a, um, a little poll that will, um, we, we, want, we want to ask you your motivations because basically we want to be able to tailor these webinars so they're sort of super interesting, well, you know, interesting and useful to, um, to you all. I'm not sure how many, well, in fact, at the moment we have 96 people online. Um, which is nice, and um, we'll just give a few um, more people a sort of opportunity to um, to start. So, what's going to happen? So, don't forget to fill in the poll. Hopefully, that's um, obvious enough to you. Um, so, what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to have a um, presentation. So, um, from Lutz. So, my name is Marty Peacock. I'm one of the founders of Zimmer Peacock. Lutz is um, one of the key application guys at um, PalmSense. He has a PhD in electrochemistry, which means he's in incredibly in interesting to talk to at parties. Um, I also have that. I also have a PhD in electrochemistry as well. Um, and um, Lutz will be introducing the um, electrochemistry that we're going to be doing. He's going to be talking about caffeine. He's going to be showing you some exciting structures of caffeine. He's going to be talking about oxidation and reduction. And then what's quite nice is then they have a really excellent um, potential stat at PalmSense called the Sense It Smart. Um, now, we actually have a few of those at Zimmer and Peacock, and we'll be taking one of our um, screen printed electrodes and we'll be putting it into the Sense It Smart. And then Sol Run, one of our engineers, um, will be doing a demonstration. So I'll just make a, a mental note to say to Mots, um, turn the gimbal on Mots so we're all ready. And like I say, there's a poll. If you could fill in the poll, that would be completely great. Um, just saying what your motivation is. If you're here to learn about food science, that's great. We'll be doing caffeine. If you want to learn about electrochemistry, that's great. We'll be doing cyclovoltammetry. And there'll be some academic material coming from Lutz. And then there'll be a live demo coming from Sol Run. And just know that it's worth following us on the social media because there'll be a video coming out afterwards where we'll integrate the screen of the android phone that be running the app with the video so you can see it a bit better because it's sometimes hard to follow that screen in the actual video i will be quiet now and i think um we'll hand over to um lutz and Lutz, i look really look forward to this thank you martin for the introduction and yes people do love to hear about my research at parties they just leave all the time afterwards. Um, so, hi, hello and welcome from me. I'm Lutz Stratmann. I'm an electrochemist at PalmSense. Well, Martin already gave me, I uh, gave you the introduction of me. Um, so let's just get started. So we want to start with some simple, um, let's say, foundations with some theoretical background here. Just first question is always when you do an experiment, like why would that be interesting? Why is detection of caffeine interested? Well, caffeine is present in many drinks that we consume, and I think we're all aware of it. Um, we have a high coffee con uh, consume, um, but you also find it in energy drinks and other beverages. Um, but also caffeine is present in medicine. Uh, for example, in painkillers that you take when you have a cold, sometimes there's caffeine in there to get rid of that typical tiredness you get when you're sick. So for these kind of medicines that just try to keep you functioning, um, they sometimes do have caffeine in there. So this means there's a significant amount of economic products that require a high quality standard. So where you need to have the detection, where you need to analyze what you're having there. Also, caffeine is the most common psychoactive drug. 
meaning of psychoactive substance, <laughs> meaning we, we find it everywhere and psychoactive meaning it changed the way how we feel or perceive things. So um, it gives you this, this little kick, right? That you, that you feel awake, but, but be careful. There's, there's a trade off when you, when you are under the influence of caffeine, usually in the fight or flight state. So maybe it's not always a good idea to uh, pump yourself up with uh, caffeine and then be awake and alert. Um, well, however, so it's the most common one. So you will rather find a beverage with caffeine in a supermarket than one with LSD. Also, it can be used as a natural insecticide. And um, when I use the word natural as a chemist, I do have the urge to do this because of course, usually you would use then not caffeine that's extracted from, from plants, but most likely something that's synthesized or in other ways made in a cheap way. But yes, but you can use it against insects. And uh, now to be a bit more, let's say, a bit more accurate with the science, um, you see here the structure of caffeine and um, well don't be don't be too scared if you're not not a chemist it's just for completion that we have shown this so you see here the structure of caffeine with its ar aromatic rings and um, some multiple different atoms in there not only car uh, carbon and oxygen but also we have for example nitrogen in here and what we're going to do is we're going to oxidize caffeine so we're going to take away electrons so because oxidation is the loss of electrons, so we're going to take away a few electrons and this way get the uh, get, get caffeine oxidated. And we're not doing that with another chemical. What we're doing, we're doing um, electrochemistry. So we're having an electrode and the electrode is taking away the electrons from the caffeine. And this is what we're going to measure. This is what we want to see now. Um, Food samples, as we're going to use them today, they always have certain challenges. For example, they're usually a complex matrix. So often in food, you don't only have like one thing, but you have a mixture of different, well, even types or uh, the types of substances. So you have fat in there, you have protein, you have different ions, you might even have polymers in there. And then um, you might have redox active species in there as well. So other species would like to be reduced or oxidized. So this makes it quite difficult to not have any interferences in your measurement. So you don't have other substances um, where the oxidation or reduction is so close to you, the reaction of your analyte that it's changing the outcome of your your measurement. Also another problem is biofouling and that means that film is growing or other substances are just blocking the electrode. And to overcome these challenges uh, we can choose different approaches. So one is sample preparation. So for example if we extract our analyte from a food sample, right, let's say, I don't know, if you want to look at, at certain um, say certain substances that you get when you fry potatoes you might you might want to um, puree your potatoes and put them in certain solvents and shake them etc that's way too much work we don't want that it is a way of doing it but it's not very handy for like a point of care or for like an on-site measurement with a portable device we don't that's not really handy membranes are another option where you cover the electrode and protect it from um, species that you're not interested in, but the membrane needs then to be permeable for the analyte you're interested in. Also, um, selective electrodes are a good approach. For example, the last time we have um, shown you a glucose measurement with an electrode that was modified with glucose oxidase, which is an enzyme that is very selectively only reacting with glucose. Another option are one-shot electrodes to avoid biofouling so you don't grow a film because you use the electrode one time and you throw it away. Okay, that is a bit the challenge for food samples. And today we want to look at two food samples. And why have we chosen these type of food samples? Well, we've chosen an energy drink because energy drinks allow you to have a, well, are like a controlled media. The ingredients are in there and nothing else. And the ingredients are usually quite clear because it's, well, this is an artificially made beverage. We don't like uh, take a fruit from a tree and squeeze it out. 
With coffee, it's more complex because not only do we take the coffee bean and make an extraction of that, no, we roast it before, creating even more different molecules because the different molecules that have been in there before are now in different oxidation states, etc. So there we have a mixture of multiple organic compounds, which is nice because they do give different flavors and they do give aroma, so you can nicely smell it and feel homely with your coffee. However, for a measurement, it's not very nice if you have a mixture of unknown substances. So this is a bit more of a challenge. Well, how are we going to do our electrochemical detection? What do you require for electrochemical, electrochemical detection? Well, so first of all, you need your sample. It should be in a solution, and the solution is usually better. There are ways to measure solid samples, but most of them end up to being ex extractions of, of the solid sample. Like when you have soil measurements, often you put, uh, you put the soil in another solvent and extract what you want to measure. But however, so we have liquid samples this time, which is very handy. We have our uh, electrodes, so you need an interface where the reaction that you're using for the detection is going to take place. This time, we're using the Z and P hypervalue carbon electrodes, so they do have a carbon interface. And uh, yeah, and they're made by Zim and Peacock. As a potentiostat, we're using um, the Sensit Smart, and the potentiostat is now the device that will apply the potential and control the potential at the electrodes so that the reaction can happen and at the same time measure the current. Then we have a, a software and a computer to control the potentiostat, and in our case, we can use a smartphone with our app PS Touch. And what you can see here is also the explanation why you see today two companies working together for this webinar. You have PalmSense, and we are uh, responsible here for the um, electronics and the potentiostats for the instrument and the software controlling it. While Zimmer and Peacock has, a very, has the knowledge about the chemistry, has a firm grip on the electrochemistry, um, uh, on the electrode production. So like quality control, reproducibility, what electrode is suitable for which application, etc. Okay, so um, just to give you a bit more information on the Sensit Smart, it is a potentiostat that has roughly the size of a USB stick, although USB sticks today are even smaller. So of a USB stick from 10 years ago. <laughs> and, um, and it's based on the Amstead Pico, which is an OEM module for electrochemistry. So it's like a chip potentiostat. And it can be easily plugged into a smartphone for powering and communication and control. And it can perform all the important electrochemical techniques like cyclic voltammetry, square wave voltammetry, chrono amperometry, and even electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Well, but this is supposed to be about caffeine me measurement. So if you want to know more, just visit www.palmsense.com. Yes, what are we going to do today is cyclic voltammetry. And just a very brief introduction. So what we're doing here is we're making a linear sweep. So we're increasing in a linear way our potential over time with a defined slope, which is the scan rate, and then add at a specific potential, the vertex potential, we are using now the same slope, but times minus one. So we're going in the opposite direction, but with the same slope. And what then happens is the following. If we have chosen these potentials in a smart way, and the substance uh, that we're interested in has uh, the point where it oxidizes or reduces, um, in this potential range, we will see first an increase in current when we provide enough potential, so enough driving force for the reaction to happen. And then we see a decrease in potential because we are depleting that species that we're using for the reaction in front of the electrode. Right, and then if the reaction is reversible, which, um, which not all reactions are, but if it's re uh, reversible, you would see when you go back this uh, negative reducing current. And what you then do is usually you're not plotting these two over time, but you're plotting it versus potential. So you plot the current versus the potential to make, an, to make a voltammogram. 
And yes, so this, this is uh, uh, then the voltammogram. And usually they have very distinctive shape. So in the past, they were talking about, uh, they were saying that cyclic voltammetry is the spectroscopy of the electrochemist because you were getting these characteristic shapes that you could compare between different compounds. Um, however, nowadays we have electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, so maybe that's more the spectroscopy of the electrochemist. But just to give you an idea that we work here with a rather visual technique. Okay, um, now as the last thing I would just like to tell you what settings we're doing so we don't have to go through it in detail when we are actually in the lab. Um, so in our app PS Touch, you can set which technique you want. And as I said, we're going to use cyclic photometry. We're going to set our current ranges, which are one microampere to one milliampere. And the current range is basically defining how sensitive the potential state is. So at a low current range, you can measure low currents very well resolved. However, if you have the larger currents, the potential set can't handle that anymore. Modern potential stats usually have auto ranging. That means you can choose multiple current ranges, just like here for the Sensit Smart. And, um, and the potential stat will change the current range if they think that's necessary. Um, then we have an equilibration time, so waiting time of zero seconds, which makes the measurement also a bit quicker. We begin the scan at a minus 100 millivolts. We go up to 1.2 volts, right? And then we would turn again at, so the second vertex potential where we would, uh, if we would make multiple scans, like flip again, the scan rate is again, the minus 100 millivolts. However, we're just doing one scan. And as a scan rate, so how quick we change the potential with time, we'd have changing it with 100 millivolts per second. And this is already everything we need to perform this experiment. So I would like now to leave you in the hands of Solren, who will perform the experiment with you. Hey, so my name is Solren. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Lutz. And now I will demonstrate how we will detect the caffeine in different beverages, um, as Martin and Lutz has uh, already uh, told us. So we have the very neat Sense It Smart, and we will insert it into our smartphone like that. And then we will access uh, Palm Sense's PS Touch, um, and we will insert one of Simran Peacock's um, one of Simran Peacock's uh, screen printed electrodes, and be sure to align the lines like this um, and then we will start off with measuring um, PBS but first we need to change the method so that we have cyclic voltometry and we will uh, set the parameters like Lutz said to one micro amps to one milliamp and then we will change the cyclic voltometry settings uh, for we will start with minus 0 0.1 volts and then we will cycle up to 1.2 volts and then we will go back down to uh, minus 0 0.1 volts uh, each step is fine with 0 0.01 and our scan rate should be 0 0.1 volts per second. And then we will go to plot and we will start the measurement. Be sure to cover all the electrodes uh, with the solution. And then we will hit play. So um, this solution right now, this is just a blank solution. It's just a buffer. So it doesn't contain caffeine. So as Lutz said, he said that um, normally we would uh, oxidize the um, oxidize the the caffeine molecule, um, and then we will. Okay, I just need to check whether we have the. Let's see. Not just sure. check your settings. Yeah, you might have just put the yeah. settings in slightly wrong. So no, no issues. It was an interesting. It was an interesting comment. Somebody just made an interesting comment about 
you know, to, if you want to validate an electrochemical assay like this, then you want to run, you know, something like an HPLC. So you would make the sort of standard, let's say, um, caffeine samples, and you would test them both by HPLC, that's high pressure liquid chromatography. And you would also then test them by electrochemistry and then kind of come up with essentially with a calibration curve where you, you know, electrochemical signal versus HPLC, either area under curve or um, peak. And that would be a good way of um, validating it. So once you check your settings, so if you're ready, that's great. I'll, I'll do what I'm good at, just closing my mouth. But if you... <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for you. All right, sweet. Right now we start a new measurements. And I think actually what you saw was that, um, I said that it's important to align the lines of the sensor with the sensor smart. Uh, which I didn't. Um, it looks crooked. Was, it looks crooked. Yeah. Yeah. That was to show you guys what happens when you don't do properly. So it was all planned for. <laughs> um, uh, but now I uh, I aligned the lines. So you can see if you look at the sensor, it has like three lines that are connected to each of the electrodes, and also on the sensor smart it has three lines. So you just need to be sure to align those. Um, so that was a small glitch for me there. Uh, and here you see the uh, voltagram of uh, PBS. And now we will move on to the one for coffee. So we'll remove that and put this in. And we will insert our sensor into coffee. Mm, like that. And then we'll hit play and we'll choose overlay so that we get the scans right next to each other so that they're easy to compare. And what you see now is that the current is increasing quite a lot compared to that for PBS. So we're measuring the current um, by varying the, the potential. And here you see, yeah um that we have a far greater current for the different oxidation uh, peaks for coffee compared to pbs yeah mm. and then we will move on to red bull And we will hit play yet again, put an overlay there. Yep. And yet again, you see with this curve coming here, the oxidation peaks are um, higher than the PBS, but they're lower than the that for coffee. And for Red Bull, we have a concentration of caffeine that is approximately 32 milligrams per 100 milliliter. But for coffee, we have um, from 50 to 100, I, I pulled a cup of coffee from our coffee machine downstairs. So I don't know the exact uh, concentration, but at least uh, the currents here are related to the concentration in our um, solution. Yes, so back to you, Martin. Yeah, cool, thanks very much. Um, so we are going to have a Q&A um, session in, in a bit. I also think there's another poll that would be available um, to the attendees and the poll will ask the question, um, what would you like to um, see maybe at a next webinar? So this is the second webinar that we've done um, and we got a nice response from the first one. So it motivated us to do a second one. Um, I'm seeing actually a lot of questions um, flashing up now. I mean, I, I, I was probably looking in the wrong place, but I realized there might be even like you know a lot of questions so anyway so we're gonna have a we're gonna have a q a session at the moment but i maybe just sort of summarize what we've seen so first of all i think let's put it very well that cyclovoltammetry is for me is really just um it's it's absorption spectroscopy but the electrochemical equivalent so you know you essentially get us you, you run a, a experiment you get some peaks and those peaks should be indicative of the molecule or the sample of interest so when we did pbs it was actually very boring. Um, there was not much features to it. But as soon as we went towards the coffee or the Red Bull, then you started getting some peaks. And there were a few there were a few um, questions like, shouldn't you clean the electrode? Yeah, you, you should clean the electrode. But um, 
we didn't for today, but no, these are, these are relevant questions. So I encourage you to um, ask questions. Um, and so, like I said, there's a poll, so please fill the poll out because if we're not gonna answer your question today, we didn't see something that you want to see, then um, fill in the poll. You know, If you want us to do other types of foods, please put that in there. If you want us to do more stuff around electrochemistry and dig in a bit deeper on the electrochemistry, um, fill in, fill in and, and put that in there. Um, I can pe see people asking very technical questions about ranges um, and you know, we'll be happy to answer those. And I would say this as well, we at ZP, we do come across a lot of people who are very interested in developing electronics. Even if you are developing electronics, I'd encourage you to get something like the Sense It Smart, because unless you have what we call the golden standard, i.e. something that works, it's very hard to do, you know, develop anything because you need to know, you know, you need to have something that at least works so then you can compare yours versus theirs. So I know there's a few people who are out there who like to design very super low cost electronics for biosensors. Even in those cases, get something that works because then you can sort of um, base your electronics on that. And I just saw an interesting question come through about toxins and somebody was interested about corrosion. So I'll, I'll be quiet now, RD, and remind everyone to do that poll, which is what do you want us to speak about next time? Oh, and heavy metals as well, very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, and thanks everyone for asking all the questions. Uh, I see there are a lot of them coming in. Let's start with, uh, with the first one. I think this one is perfect for Lutz. Lutz, um, can you use the PalmSense 4, which is another product from, uh, from PalmSense, for caffeine measurements? Yes, so uh, the PalmSense 4 is actually more powerful than the Sense It Smart. So, Usually everything the Sensit Smart can do, the PalmSense 4 can do as well. Um, but it's a bigger device. It's a bigger device. It has Bluetooth integrated. It has a battery integrated. It has a higher potential range you can go to. However, um, for this type of experiment that we wanted to show today, like how you can do an easy on-site measurement, it is a bigger potential stat. It makes it look a bit more, uh, let's say, chunky. However, you can use that as well. And I have seen people making, um, in, in the comments, I've seen people also making that comment that they say like, oh, I would rather use a droplet um, than having my potential stat so close to the solution. That is possible as well. I mean, it always depends on your system and diffusion limitations, how well the how well your solution will form a droplet, et cetera. And that is with the Palm Sense 4 also nice because we have a holder that you can like detach to the front of it. And then you have already like your electrode in a um, in a horizontal manner that you can put a droplet on it. I mean, the same would be possible if Solron just lies the tablet flat on the table and uh, enter the sense it's smart. Um, but that's usually not as nicely visible as when you put it in a stand. I think this was more reasons of show than it was a scientific reason to put it above the solution. But maybe Solron can comment on that. Yeah, so, oh yeah, so we're going to come back. Can you put the webinar back on the screen? Yeah, it was it was definitely uh, for sure. It's easier uh, with a stand rather than holding it myself, especially when I speak so that I wouldn't uh, dip the really nice um, sensor smart into the solution. So to be able to focus on several things I used to stand for today. And it's probably worth saying um, that most of the time when we're testing in the lab, we're actually, we're actually pipetting the samples onto the electrodes. Mm. So, you know, whereas today we're dipping that sensor into the solution, that's actually quite rare for us. We've generally got the electrode in a kind of, and the phone in the horizontal, and we're, you know, essentially pipetting something like less than 30 microliters onto the end of the electrode and just doing it um, that way. So some of these questions are very relevant, but what we're doing today is for show, um, but it's, you know, the beauty about screen printed electrodes and about electrochemistry in general is you don't need large samples. You know, one drop of blood should be enough. Um, so we tend not to dip the sensors so much. We do quite like to bring um, the sample to the sensor by using a pipette. Exactly. All right, yeah, Luz. M Martin, was there a specific reason that, that you, you, we chose dipping this time? It's just it's just for the show, right? You could have yeah, yeah. also done it with a droplet, right? No, I've done, yeah, I've done, it, I've done it with droplets plenty of times, um, you know. 
Uh, yeah, so the quick answer is look, there's, there's absolutely no reason um, not to have just done it by the droplets. Um, and I've actually got yeah, YouTube videos about me doing it using droplets as well. All right, thank you. Um, and I see also a lot of comments coming in on the poll. So other uh, things and other um, uh, topics the next webinar should be about. So thank you all. Um, another question, this is for you, Martin. Uh, are there any uh, ZMP electrodes that are 510C compliant, as you know? Yeah, I was. I was just looking. I was just looking up that uh, the, the definition of it because I was trying to. I was trying to recognize what it was. I wasn't sure if this was a a, a the quick quick answer. Is I was just googling five ten C. I I know what a five ten K is, which is an FDA um, regulatory let's say procedure. But I don't know what five ten C is. That is that disposal of electronic goods. Are did you recognize the five ten C? Because I don't think I do. Or was it, was it five? Uh, miss. Mr. Evans can uh, can explain a bit more what what he's what he means by that question. Uh, so let's quickly go to the next one. Um, all right. And there is another question. This one is, I think, yeah, for both of you could be. So let's see who's the first to react. Uh, how do we know that the current is due to the caffeine uh, oxidation only? No, and I and, and I think I think I mean this is for show, sure, and I, I I agree with that statement. So the the quick answer is. Um, to really do this um, more robustly, you you know, as you already probably know, you, you, we really have to buy in some caffeine or just do a neat caffeine. And so what we're going to find out is in that broad uh, oxidation peak, there's actually several compounds in there. And, and, and actually there'll be one compound, caffeine will be in there, but it's not, the broadness of the peak is due to many molecules in there. Now the question could be, well, what's the specificity in that case? And I think I saw an interesting comment from somebody using HPLC earlier, HPLC earlier on. What you want to do is actually make up um, a series of solutions of caffeine and do the electrochemistry and do the HPLC and compare them, make sure you've got you know, a genuine signal. And then I would actually do take real coffee, run it on the electrochemical sensor and run it on the HPLC and start you. And this sounds like fairy dust, but actually use AI to allow you to identify features in the electrochemical signal, which is going to pick up everything. And you would run AI on that signal versus what the true answer is from the HPLC and actually use AI to allow you to deconvolute essentially the, the broadness and the non-specific signal to say there are features in this signal that are actually indicative of the caffeine by HPLC. And we've been doing that quite a lot um, of recent. So, the quick answer is you're absolutely right. How do you know it's just caffeine? You don't, but you can deconvolute it, but we haven't done that today. Um, and I, what I did describe with the AI is how do you turn this into an actual product? Uh, Martin, I know, I know that you have actually a lot of uh, rather selective electrodes in your portfolio. Um, maybe you can give some examples like how, how you do it there, how you assure or how you make your electrodes selective for certain analytes just yeah, an sure. example that you have you have an idea yeah so if we were really trying to make a very caffeine specific um sensor i think i've actually seen people have made aptimus for caffeine so that would be a way of doing it so that's a more complicated assay now because you have to functionalize the electrode to be you know func um to be specific towards um caffeine now how we how we bring specificity into our senses is you know, we either identify often an aptima or an antibody that's specific to the target. We do that a lot. Or we just identify an enzyme that's specific to the target. So the classic, obviously, is glucose sensing. But the question is correct that you can't guarantee this broadest of signal is all, not all due to caffeine. It's due to the other um, colored molecules in the coffee as well. Um, but how do we do it? We build specificity to the sensor using aptimas or antibodies most often. We also do it with enzymes, but we also now do do it with using a lot of data science. So the biggest group, fastest growing group at Zimmer and Peacock is data scientists because you can deconvolute signals and electrochemistry has traditionally not done this. Um, you know, they've kind of made the sensor do all the work, but these days you can make it an okay sensor and back it up with some pretty good um, signal analysis. So the quick answer is you build the specificity onto the sensor, it only takes you so far, and then you have to use good data science to extract the actual signal from the background signal. All right, thank you. Uh, and Martin, is the measurement also pH sensitive? 
Yeah, I definitely think it's pH sensitive. Um, absolutely, is a, is a quick is a quick answer. Um, many of these organic molecules where they've got these heteroatoms, so we had nitrogen and oxygen, and you know, and that that oxidation oxidation is um, sensitive to pH. So, for example, the more alkali it is, it will become oxygen will be get deprotonated. Deprotonated oxygens are easier to um, oxidize. So, the quick answer is yes. Um, it will be pH sensitive and you would probably want to fix the pH of the coffee. So what we would do is we would take one volume of coffee and mix it with four volumes of buffer and then do the analysis. So that would be one way of controlling the pH. For example, if you were trying to make a low cost point in field tester for caffeine. All right, great. Um, and let's get back to the 510C, which actually should be 510K. And it's a clearance from the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. It's uh, uh, you have to register, and uh, uh, the question was if the electrode you were using is actually registered for that. No, so I understand the question now. That's what I thought. I know. I know what a five ten k is. So just for anyone who doesn't know, a five ten k is if there's a predative, a predative um, device that's already on the market. So, for example, if there's a glucose sensor on the market, and you want to launch your glucose sensor on the market. You can show equivalence between them and say, therefore, I can now enter the market. So I believe that's what a 510K is. So Zimmer and Peacock, we have um, products on the market that are FDA approved, but we haven't done any of them by 510K. So the quick answer is no, we haven't made our glucose sensor, which would be the classic 510K. And we haven't got it um, FDA approved. And therefore, no, it's not 510K, um, let's say, approved. But I do understand the question, let's say. So that's what I thought. It, that I thought that's what the question was. Great. Yeah. Um, and then another one. Does the immersion level or droplet size affect the current magnitude? Lutz, do you want me to do it or do you want to do it? Oh, I can do it. I mean, usually for um, what's important is that all three electrodes of the sensor are covered. So you have your reference counter and working electrode and all four need to be in the same solution in the same droplet so your droplet needs to be big enough to cover this then it gets more complicated the question is does the amount of reaction you make change the whole volume or not um, i have my experience is that for most experiments the amount of substance that's actually converted is not significant for the bulk so for everything that's a bit further away from the solution. So most of the time, if you use like a droplet, if you use on a, let's say on, on a two or three millimeter diameter um, circular electrode, right? You have a disc electrode and it's like two or three millimeter diameter. Then I use 50 to 100 microliters and I don't see a difference between the bulk and the um at the droplet version so if i immerse it or if i put a droplet on it it doesn't really matter it gives the same results um i don't have like examples in my mind where it would matter but um, i would in general advise that if you make a calibration curve always make your calibration curve with the same method that you intend to use for your real application then so if you want to do droplets do your calibration curve with droplets however I expect that like 50 microliters plus for most substances look exactly the same as if you would have immersed it into the solution. I might, right, I might, be, I, I might be able to give you a, 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 a funny answer on that. If you scan fast, when you scan a cycle of voltammetry very fast, you build up, you sample very close to the electrodes, very close. So it doesn't matter what the rest of the volume is because you're only sampling very close to the electrode. When you scan slowly, you're, you're essentially starting to sense the overall volume. So whether volume matters or not really dep depends on scan rate. But as Lutz says, anecdotally, 50, 100 microliters is more than enough volume for most of these three millimeter diameter electrodes. So that's correct. If you did a really slow experiment, you might find these, the volume becoming part of the signal. But something like 100 millivolts or something like that's quite fast, so it wouldn't affect your signal. But there is a almost a relationship. Fast experiment, small volume samples, doesn't matter what the rest of the volume is. That would be like a rule of thumb. 
There is actually a funny, well, not funny, but an interesting trivia fact if you want to. Um, the glucose uh, measurements that you're used to, where you have like the stripe and you hold it to a droplet of blood and then it sucks in a defined volume, right? So what, that's what it does. It has a defined volume then inside this electrode and the reaction is running then inside. And actually there, the reaction is always so long that it consumes everything in the volume. That's the idea. And then they calculate what was in that volume instead of doing what you find in many other electrochemical experiments, that they look at the current, they actually look at the charge because they assume that they have consumed everything that is in this volume and this way calculate the concentration. The advantage of doing it this way is that, for example, if you're measuring in Thailand at 36 degrees or if you're measuring at Norway at 10 degrees, wouldn't matter because you just have the experiment running long enough that if the enzyme is a bit slower or faster, it doesn't matter. All right, great. Thank you, Lutz. Um, Martin, I have two more questions for you. One is a short one and another one is a longer one about cleaning. Uh, oh, yeah. The short one. Uh, what is the material used for the working electrode for the uh, for sensing caffeine? Yeah, so Lutz was kind enough to say what's good about ZP is we always, we, we know our chemistry and our electrochemistry quite well. So caffeine is quite an aromatic compound. It's got lots of carbon rings, you know, in it. So when you see that kind of thing, then generally carbon is um, good enough. So we, in this particular experiment, we were using carbon. If the output of the reaction that we were trying to analyze was hydrogen peroxide, they wouldn't worked. We would have had to have used platinum or gold there. But specifically in this example, it was a carbon um, working electrode. And if anyone wants to have fun with me, just Google me about, well, um, contact us and talk about graphene. Because I know everyone loves a bit of graphene these days. So that was one of the right. questions, Ardi. Yeah, perfect. And the other one was about uh, what procedure do you recommend for the cleaning of the screen treated uh, electrode? I think with with these hypervalue electrodes, the, the procedure I um I suggest, I mean, I you know, to, it's just to throw them away. Um, now you know they're ninety nine cents each. So I do understand that you know in, in in some economies that's quite a lot. In some other other economies, it's not too bad. Um, but the carbon electrodes. We have we haven't found an amazing procedure for cleaning them. Um, the problem with cleaning is you're essentially eroding the surface, so you're changing the surface. So next time you go to use the electrode, you might have a slightly rougher electrode, and therefore its sensitivity will appear higher. So with the carbon, it's actually quite hard to recommend a cleaning procedure other than just cleaning it with a bit of tissue. But I can't absolutely recommend it because we don't do it a lot. We just unfortunately throw them away. If it was gold or platinum. We actually sometimes polish them just like we would a disc electrode with some slurry. But again, we don't do it too much. I mean, our, most of our workflows are, you know, we're making biosensors that sample goes on, the patient gets the results and the sensor's thrown away. So we don't want to be in the job of recycling electrodes because every time you recycle, you change the surface and then, you know, the surface is changing with time and the signal will therefore change. So um, we do do slurry cleaning. If it's gold electrodes, we do clean with like 10 millimolar HCl. If it's carbon electrodes, we might just clean them with a little bit of tissue. Um, but it's not the same as disc electrodes where you can kind of, you know, gr polish them with some slurry. It's, you know, I don't have a... And some, for example, some assays that we do, the, the organic molecules bind to the carbon and you're never going to get them off. They, You know, that's just the end of it. And I think the chili sensor that we make is a good example of that. The chili polymerizes to the surface and we can never get it off so you can't recycle them Ma so martin how is it if you um want to clean them before you make a modification right if you're buying it for a research project and you want to immobilize your aptamers or anything like how do you usually prepare the electrodes for that like you, that's usually a cleaning step involved in that as well isn't it yeah i mean i do i do do some you know webinars every thursday at 8 a.m um, london time and we, we do answer that question quite a bit we often we take our electrode, we do cyclovoltammetry and ferrocyanide just to characterize it. But in doing that, that's really a cleaning step. So the quick answer is we, we have a workflow where we take the bare electrodes, we characterize the bare electrodes using cyclovoltammetry. But you could argue that's also a cleaning step. And then we go on to do the actual, um, let's say we were going to you know, um, do some modification of the surface after that. So I suppose the quick answer is, 
we confirm the cleanliness of the surface using something like five to 10 millimolar ferry ferrocyanide. All right, that's clear. Um, Lutz, um, a question for you. Is the sensor application, uh, or if the sensor application, does it support iPhone and iPads as well? Um, not from us. No, we don't have an ready end user software for um, Apple systems at the moment. What we do have is um, we have coding examples for the, um, for the iOS system because um, as I mentioned before, the Sensit Smart is based on the Amstead Pico. And the Amstead Pico is an OEM potential stand. That means we think people will build it into their own devices. And this means they also will want to do their own software. And of course, you don't want to make this very difficult for your customer, right? If we already know they want to make their own software, we should give them the tools to do that. We've done that in the past, like for many of our instruments, you can have software development kits. But with the Amstead Pico, we started like a new way of doing these with an extra programming language called MethodScript, which, is, um, which makes it very easy to work on many different platforms. And on our website, you can find a lot of coding examples for MethodScript. And among these is also one for iOS. And that is uh, like enough of an user interface uh, of, uh, of a GUI that you can use to actually control the Sensit Smart or the Amstead 4S already. Um, so in this sense, so indirectly, yes, we have, but not, we don't have some things, an end user software like PS Touch for Android or PS Trace for window, Windows. We don't have an equivalent for that for the iOS systems at the moment. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we've been to almost all questions, uh, and it's we're a bit over time as well. So I would like to thank everyone for their questions. If you still have another question, you can always contact either Simran Peacock or Palm Sense without any problems. Um, so thank you all for attending, um, and yeah, I'll see you for the next webinar. Thanks, Aldi. All right, bye bye everyone. Cheers. Cheers, everyone.